Well, it's great to be back at Caltech after about 40 years. Uh, and what I'm going to tell you is something about Feynman's contributions to computing. You all know about his contributions to physics, but I thought I'd tell you something of the things he did in computing throughout his career. And I'm going to do that by telling you three stories. So the first one dates to the days of the Manhattan Project uh, in Los Alamos with Oppenheimer and the others, where they were inventing the atomic bomb. And Feynman was put in charge of the IBM team. Now, what was the IBM team? Well, it was in the days before computers. They had tabulators, calculators, sorters, collators, and so on, but they didn't have computers. And there was a problem. They were trying to do these complicated calculations for the implosion bomb. You had to position the explosives very carefully to make a spherical compression rate. And the calculations were just going too slowly. So Feynman took over, and uh, Feynman analyzed the problem, and he realized that you could do not just one problem at once, you could do several problems at once. So you had a deck of cards for one geometry in one color and another deck of cards in another color, and you could have many problems going at the same time. And so what Feynman had essentially invented was a standard technique of parallel computing called pipelining, where you get several problems going on at the same time. And that was pretty cool in the days before you had computers. And the result was a complete transformation. Instead of three calculations in nine months, they did nine calculations in three months. And so Feynman made a contribution to the IBM team at Los Alamos. The next thing I'd like to tell you about um, is a story about Feynman diagrams. Now, we all know Feynman diagrams. They're part of the everybody's blackboard, and, and, and we know all about them. But it's difficult to imagine that that was not always the case. And Feynman was very unsure whether he'd actually done anything. And, and, and there was a famous conference at Pocono, Pocono uh, uh, where he and Schwinger were talking to all the experts of modern physics. So there was Paul Dirac, Niels Bohr, Robert Oppenheimer, Edward Teller, and all these great people. And Feynman was unable to make himself understood. He, he just couldn't get through. And he lamented afterwards, my machines came from too far away. Because he was talking about things like positrons as negative energy electrons traveling backwards in time. And that was just too unfamiliar for them. Um, but Feynman was able, eventually, uh, a year later, in 1949, at an American Physical Society meeting in New York, to actually understand that he really had done something. And that came about as follows. And it also illustrates Feynman's distrust of grand theorems and much, much preferred actually real calculations. And it, in that uh, meeting, uh, Murray Slotnick uh, gave a talk uh, about the inequivalence of two different meson nucleon couplings. And he gave his talk. And at the end of his talk, the great Robert Oppenheimer stood up from the audience and said, Professor Slotnick, your talk must be wrong because it violates Case's theorem. And poor old Slotnick said, I've never heard of Case's theorem. And, you know, and Oppenheimer said, don't worry, you can remedy your ignorance tomorrow afternoon when Professor Case is presenting his theorem. So Slotnick crawled off the stage, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, OK, so Feynman couldn't sleep that night at home. And so what he did, he decided to use his methods to reproduce Slotnick's calculations. And so he did that, and then he sought out Slotnick the next day and came up to Slotnick and said, hey, Slotnick, why don't we compare notes? I redid your calculations last night, and we can see if I agree. Slotnick said, what do you mean you redid them last night? It took me six months. <laughs> Feynman said, I've got these methods, see? Right. <laughs> anyway, they compared the notes, and uh, what they discovered was that Feynman and Slotnick agreed. So, after Case had presented his talk that afternoon, Feynman got up from the audience and said, uh, Professor Case, I checked Slotnick's calculations last night. I agree with Slotnick. Your theorem must be wrong, and sat down. <laughs> and he said afterwards, that's when I knew I'd got some techniques that nobody else had, and he'd done something significant, for which he would later win the Nobel Prize. So, that's the story about Slotnick. The last story goes back to the uh, Physics of Computation Conference at MIT in 1981. Feynman spent the last six or seven years of his life 
working on computation. He worked with Danny Hillis and his son Carl at Thinking Machines, and he also was persuaded to give a keynote at this conference where he talked about uh, the problems of physics of computation simulating nature with a classical computer. And that's very difficult to do because nature is ultimately quantum mechanical. And things rapidly get out of hands as soon as you get too many quantum systems, it becomes impractical to simulate on a classical computer. So Feynman developed the idea of a quantum computer. And Feynman also realized that a quantum computer was not a Turing machine. It was a machine of a different kind. And so uh, from that lecture, Feynman then went on to prepare some lectures at Caltech on the limits of computation. And he talked to lots of computer scientists. And I'd like to play you a little clip from a lecture he gave at Bell Labs around that time, where he tells you what he thinks about computer science. I don't believe in computer science. <laughs> to, to me, science is a study of the behavior of nature. And engineering, or applied things, is the behavior of things we make. You need to know how nature works in order to make the things, and so you use science in engineering, but you're doing it for a human... Human purpose was what it was meant to say. So Feynman gave these lectures at Caltech, and he talked about the, the limits uh, to computation due to mathematics, uh, due to noise, due to thermodynamics, where you could have reversible computing, so you could compute, and then you could uncompute, uh, and uh, due to silicon engineering, and of course, due to quantum mechanics. And uh, in all of these lectures, they were about a, a decade ahead of their time. They're really remarkable lectures. Uh, what he found out, throughout of these, he was not concerned about the energy loss in computers. And so what he thought about the energy problem was that they were a billion times more inefficient than they needed to be, the switching devices. And so um, for the next 50 years, I think as we reduce the number of atoms in the switching devices from which we build computers, you will see that the energy uh, consumption becomes much less and we learn to engineer them much better. And that's the prediction from Feynman's lectures. And the last thing to end is, when I came to Caltech, fresh from Oxford, I used to think the world revolved a bit round Oxford. I came to Caltech and realized to a first approximation, Europe doesn't exist, let alone <laughs> Oxford. <laughs> and then, you know, I was in the group of Feynman and Gell-Mann, and uh, in the California Tech, there was this photograph of the five Nobel Prize winners at Caltech in 1969. And there's Feynman, right? And the headline was, Four Kings and the Joker. But Feynman didn't just dress differently. As you've heard today, Feynman genuinely thought differently. Thank you very much. Thank you.